Hello and welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 66. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by the boy from Brooklyn, Mr. Chad Owen. Good morning. I hear you're in a different location this week, Mike. You're not coming to us from the sunny shores of Sydney Harbour. No, uh, it is uh, not from the warm surrounds of Sydney, but uh, the slightly chillier surrounds of Bucharest. And next week it will be London. But whilst it's chilly on the outside here, I'm feeling sort of cozy and ready to dive into one of our absolute favorite books from one of our favorite authors, Chad Owen. What adventures are we on today? Yeah, your, your travels will not keep us from producing and bringing <laughs> you the show. Uh, I feel like we've been talking about this book since we started the podcast almost, what was it, three years ago now, Mike? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So this is, uh, of course, the book Good to Great. We, we previewed, you know, been previewing the series uh, for quite some time now. If you, if you can't tell, Mike and I are very excited about practically everything that Jim Collins, Jerry Porras, and others uh, have written. And the interesting thing about this book is even though it was published after uh, Built to Last, Jim kind of mentions this as a potential prequel to Built to Last. But regardless of the order, I think the principles here are as timeless or even more timeless and applicable uh, as to those that we uncovered during Built to Last. And uh, we've got an interesting format to the show this week as well, where we've got one really great clip that encapsulates every single uh, chapter in the book. So I'm real excited to bring those clips mm. to you today. Yeah. And, and I think we should try and share a little bit of our enthusiasm for, for Jim here, particularly for those who are brand new listeners or have recently joined the the show, we welcome you. And if you're looking for any of our previous show or our, our show notes, you can pop over to moonshots.io. Uh, and for those who are our beloved loyal listeners, please jump on to your favorite podcast app, give us a, a review, give us a rating. I think we're up to nearly 40 reviews on the uh, iOS Apple podcast store. So that is great because that gets uh, the show into the hands of many, many more people. Um, and that really matters because what we're doing here is decoding one of the greatest living business authors. And we did uh, in the recent show, Built to Last, which was all about starting with creating not just a product, but way more than that, starting with the idea of what's the legacy that you really want your company to leave? What is the What's the environment that you want to create? Um, how do you want to take care of your people? And that was encapsulated by the story of the founders of HP, uh, the very, very uh, famous and well-known tech company, where the founders got together and agreed on everything about the company and how they wanted to behave, except for the products that they were going to make. Yeah. And they deferred that <laughs> to the next meeting. I mean, is that not perfect, Chad? Yeah, I can't think of any startups in the last 15 or 20 years that didn't uh, first start with a quote unquote genius product idea. Right. Uh, so the fact that one of you know the most enduring tech companies ever started with just two highly aligned, purposeful founders, mm. and they're like, "Yeah, we'll figure out what we want to build later." Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what's so great? That's all about legacy and values and vision. The next show will all be about discipline, and so we'll be diving into the book. Great by Choice by Jim Collins. But today we go into Good to Great. And what an exciting book because they studied a lot of different companies that were publicly listed over many decades to find those that transitioned from good to great. And what we have for you today is seven clips. Six of those are the true backbone ideas of the book, which are so timeless and so powerful. And they play into some of the great thinking of both Drucker and Simon Sinek, who we've also covered on the show. But this is one powerhouse, action-packed show. So I tell you what, no matter what time of day it is, if you're starting uh, the show now, I say get an espresso coffee, get out your notebook, because we're going to go deep into the world of good to great. 
And we'll start off with a clip that gets into a little bit how Jim and his team of researchers approached this second very large research project when they were trying to answer a a leftover question after they completed the built to last study, which was, okay, so we we've identified what has made these companies be such an enduring and lasting company, but how did they become great in the first place? It's very dangerous to study success. Uh, So we don't study success. We study contrast. We study the contrast between success and failure. We study the contrast between endurance and collapse. We study the contrast between great and good. We study the contrast between those who thrive in chaos and those who do not. And it brings me to a key point right up front from all of our work. See, if we identify matched pairs of companies, matched pairs of enterprises that were in the same spot, same time, same opportunities, same resources, with the same potential, and yet one becomes great and the other does not. One thrives in chaos, the other does not. One keeps climbing while the other falls, and yet their circumstances were identical or very similar at the start you come to an inevitable conclusion. The answer, the cause of why one becomes great and another not cannot be their circumstance. So if I were to take one giant lesson from all 25 years of research, I'd put it to you right up front. Greatness is not primarily a function of circumstance. It is first and foremost a matter of conscious choice End of discipline. Mm. Wow, there's so there's so much. he's just getting <laughs> me started here. Well, first of all, I love the fact that he points out that he really was almost forensic in finding out and isolating what factors led to greatness. And to me, that's where the value and the timelessness of his work lays, is that they were able to do that very thing. And don't you that don't you think, Chad, it's almost that that sort of forensic approach is what creates the power of these the next six ideas we're gonna lay out on the show. I think that that is the source. And I think it's such a powerful approach to kind of isolate what is the thing that great companies do. Yeah. And he's not just sitting in his office in Boulder, Colorado, you know, thinking up these ideas. He and a team of dozens of researchers spent six years going through all of the data to to figure out what the, the, the differentiating factors were of great companies versus good companies. And at first, they looked at the stock price performance of similar companies in similar industries over time. And what they were looking for was a company that had a period of 10 to 15 years of of expanded and continuous growth as compared to the quote unquote control company. And uh, if you if you you know go to our show notes, you'll you'll find the the full list of all the different companies. But the the outliers that they were looking for were uh, the companies that had 10 to 15 years of 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 breakthrough in terms of of stock price performance. And then they conducted you know, hundreds, if not thousands of hours of interviews with leaders and employees of those companies to figure out what made the difference between two companies that had the same circumstances. They were in the same industry, were building similar products, had access to the same talent pool, et cetera. Uh, but one company had three, four, five, and even like over a hundred X, uh, greater returns, um, than their, than their peer companies. And you and I can be data geeks, uh, sometimes, uh, when it comes to our work. And so, (laughs) you knowing that all of these principles are backed, uh, by, by so much data and academic rigor is just really exciting. And it speaks to the timelessness of these ideas. Yeah. And draw some parallels with, the likes of Cal Newport, Brené Brown, Drucker, and so forth. But, um, well, here's one thing for sure that we know. It wasn't just good luck. It wasn't chance. There were some very deliberate things that happened 
And the first of those was what he calls level five leadership. And um, what is so good about what we're going to do right now is listen to Jim Collins in his very turbocharged, excited uh, enthusiasm is we're going to hear about what it really looks like, what it really feels like, because we hear about leadership so much. And what he found is almost contrarian to what culturally has been expected about leaders. So let's have a listen now to Jim Collins talking about leadership. What's great leadership? What's the X factor of great leadership? Well, in the book, Good to Great, we studied people who transformed mediocre average companies into those that became exceptional, like taking a, an also-ran sports team and turning it into a 15-year dynasty. And when we looked at those where they fundamentally changed the trajectory of an enterprise, we discovered this idea of the level five leader. And what we found is that it's really a hierarchy. You think of it as that there's level one, level two, level three, level four, level five. Level one is good individual skills. You can kind of do stuff. Level two, good team skills. You play well with others. Level three, you learn to manage. You're good management skills. Level four is leadership. You become an effective leader. But here's what's interesting. When we looked at the good to great companies and we looked at their comparisons that didn't make that leap, and we asked a simple question. Did the good to greats have leadership and the others did not? No, we actually found that both the good to greats and the comparison had leaders. What was different was that the good to great companies had what we call level five leaders, and the comparison companies had level four leaders. So if it took the level five leaders to create a good to great leap, then in the fives versus the fours is where you might find the X factor of great leadership. And what did we find? Humility. That the X factor of truly great leadership is humility. Humility combined with a ferocious will for something bigger than yourself. Humility in a very special way. I want to be very clear. These people are ambitious. They have tremendous energy. They are often exhausting. They never want to stop. They never, they're utterly relentless. Okay, there's no, they have all that. But here's the difference. See, for a five versus a four. So for a four, all that energy and ambition and drive is about them. It's about what they get. It's about how they look. It's about what they make. It's about what accrues to them. It's about whether they are the center. That's a four. Fives, all that same level of energy and drive and ambition is channeled outward into a cause, into a company, into a culture, into a quest, into something that is bigger and more enduring than they are. Level fives lead in a spirit of service, and they subsume themselves and sacrifice I can't help but think, Mike, if we uh, subtracted a few years from Jim and gave him a slight uh, South African accent, we might be hearing from another author <laughs> that we've profiled I know. here on the show. <laughs> I know, I know. It's so cynic-esque. But um, I think we can all say that at times we've been tempted by the allure of what he calls level four leadership. Mm -hmm. um, or said differently, ego. Yeah. And what is so fascinating about his proposition is what he's really saying is that if you want to be great, that is level five leadership, and that starts with making those around you great. And we've heard about humble uh, leadership, servant leadership. But what he's saying when he looks at the data and studies those that truly have been great, he says it is those that put others before themselves. And what he talked about in, 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 in his book, and this is how we might recognize it, is these people are the last to speak in the meeting. 
these people are almost unaware of the role or at least the significance of their contribution because they're so uh, focused on the contribution of others and how they might help them. This is this leadership is not pandering. It's not uh, virtue signaling. It is a true dedication to others. Mm -hmm. And he could only find that in a dozen or so companies. So it's not easy, but we know what it looks like. So I've got a question for you, Chad. When you think about moments where you have been in the company of great leaders in your career, what does it feel like? What does it look like? What does this level five leadership look like when you've seen it? To me, it looks like a lot of focus on the purpose of the organization over the career trajectory and ego of that leader. That leader is able to succinctly state the true purpose of the organization and rally people around that purpose as opposed to rallying them around themselves and, and you know, kind of hoarding that talent and all for, all for themselves and to accrue the value for, for their own careers. And I think the other thing that Jim might also say is they're also relentlessly focused on the big, hairy, audacious goal of the company. They're often driving what that goal is and are being held ultimately accountable to achieving that goal. And again, that goal is tied to the purpose of the organization and not to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there seems to be true service to those around them and those that are making up the organization. What's also interesting is uh, he actually found that there was no correlation to being charming or a good salesman. In fact, in his book, he often found that the best leaders were quite shy even, I think is, is perhaps one way well, of saying Well, he called it. them awkward well, I found and weird that, even. Yeah. <laughs> but don't you, I find that really fascinating that it, it really does challenge what we have become trained to expect as a good leader, sort of some bombastic, you know, larger than life, charismatic. He's saying it's, in fact, it's quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think one of the most fascinating, we could get sidetracked on a whole discussion here. A fascinating leader to to view through all of these lenses is Steve Jobs, because I think he fits this mold and yet he also bucks uh, some of these principles, mm. um, which in my mind just kind of makes him and the story of Apple even more of kind of an outlier uh, exceptional story. But it, again, it's really interesting. You know, there's a lot of Apple fanboys and people often, and I'm doing it now, you know, put him up and Apple up as this, you know, exemplary you know, example. But I would, you know, as we get through some of these principles, you'll see that Steve Jobs kind of embodies the principle, but also the antithesis to the principle as well, which again, just makes him that much right. more interesting to, to study. So if, if we want to walk away with like one habit, uh, around great leadership. What comes to your mind is like, if we could adopt one little practice, Chad, to help us on our way to level five leadership, what would that be? I, I don't know. I think it would be something like the default question that that leader asks of all of their people in every interaction is how can I help you either work towards our BHAG, our big, hairy, audacious goal, or how can I help you um, find purpose and in, inside of this organization and contribute? Or it's asking the questions and how the, and, and getting involved uh, in that servant uh, leadership style. But I, I like this idea of asking that question. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yep. Just like, okay, what's the biggest block you face to to doing great work here and serving our mission. Mm -hmm. Tell me what the biggest blocker is and I'll try and smash it down for you, you know? Mm -hmm. That's a really that's a really good one to start. With. How about you? Um, I, I like the really simple mantra of being the last to speak in a meeting. You know, how often is it that, you know, the most senior so person simple, walks So simple, but so hard. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Like it's um, like so default wherever I travel in the world. 
you know, when when the the top dog walks in the room, it's like brrr, machine gun, and you're like, all righty, here we go. Um, and um, yeah, I just love the idea of okay, I'll I'll just listen. And um, I can't remember who it was that we did on the show together, but um, someone uh, we were sort of decoding and researching was saying, hey, surely that's the best way to do it because you just get to hear everyone else's ideas and then you get to pick the best one and to build off that, like surely it's the best to speak last. I can't remember who. Did, can you remember who that was? Is no, that, I am can't. I, am I hallucinating? Um, I read so much and, and watch so much of this stuff now. I can't remember if I did All it on the show. All you attentive listeners, if you know the, the show or the individual, <laughs> yeah. just shoot us an yeah, email. Help us. Hello at moonshots.io. Uh, too many shows. Um, but we're not going to stop with people stuff here, right? Uh, we're going to keep going on this leadership and people and culture track, aren't we, Chad? Yeah, we had... We had brought this uh, concept and principle into the the built to last show, but he expounds even further on the importance of of people and and getting the right people inside of the organization. And you'll see how most, if not all, of these concepts come back to this idea of the right people on the bus, which I think is a great analogy. And so here's. Jim elaborating on why it's so important to get the right people inside of your organization. I've always loved the story Silver Blaze, which is the Sherlock Holmes story where at the end of the case, the constable asks Holmes, what was the key to the case? And Holmes says it was the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. And the constable says, but the dog didn't do anything in the nighttime. Ah, ah, yes, that was the curious incident. The dog didn't bark. And so therefore, I knew the criminal must have been somebody who knew the dog. In our research, it is the dogs that do not bark that often give us some of the best clues. And the, the dogs that do not bark helped us see the who principle. Now, you would think that if you're leading a company from good to great, one of the things you would expect to see, one of the dogs you would expect to bark, is that you would find very motivating and charismatic leaders who could infuse motivation into the troops so that they would go out and do good to great things. Well, as our research unfolded, what we found is that most of the good to great leaders had had a charisma bypass. They couldn't motivate anybody as just a pure motivational force. That's not how they led. But then when we began asking them, how did you get alignment? How did you get people motivated behind what you were trying to do? The dog just didn't bark. They didn't spend any time on that. That's not how they led. And we scratched our heads a little bit. How would you make sense of the fact that you're getting a whole company to go in a different direction and yet the leaders who made this happen didn't invest in figuring out how to motivate people, how to inspire people, how to get people behind the flywheel? And this is when we learn something. See, if you have the right people, they're already motivated. The right people are self-motivated. The right people are self-disciplined. And the challenge of management, the challenge of leadership is not to how to figure out how to motivate the wrong people into the right people. It's how to get the right people and then not do all the stupid management things that tend to demotivate the already motivated people. <laughs> how powerful is the fact that we, we consume ourselves with trying to use all sorts of tricks and so forth to get people excited about bad ideas, but he's saying, no, your job is if you have the right people, they're motivated, you just need to get out of their way and not make a mess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he, in the book, he goes even further into all of these failed, you know, restructuring and promotion plans and incentives and compensation. And all of that has no correlation to a good to great company. Mm. And it also just reinforces this fact of how important that core purpose of the organization is and yep. and that ambition of the level five leader, because that's actually their biggest asset when it comes to recruiting people. And I feel like I'm talking like Simon Sinek now too. It's just, you, you get them behind the why and, mm -hmm. and you don't have to spend- They'll work out the rest. Yeah. Ex 
Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing that comes up a lot is often, and uh, both Cynic and, and especially Jim Collins touch on it, is often then when people aren't performing, it's not because they're bad or that they even have a poor fit with the organization. It's that they're playing out of position. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he's, he's really pushing us to, to not only recruit the right people, but to get people playing to their strengths where they can be experiencing true mastery. And he's almost making the, the best case ever for don't micromanage. Yeah. But I think another great clip, you know, go back to the end of the previous episode, episode 65, oh, and yeah, listen to yeah. the first who, then what clip. It just, he's speaking so passionately about the need to identify first who you're bringing into the organization and only after you've brought the right person in to then figure out what it is that they're doing. This is, as many of these principles, sort of counterintuitive or contradictory to typical uh, ways of, of hiring and, and recruiting talent. You figure out all of the things, you write the job description, here's the 10 things that they're going to be held accountable to, and then you go out and find that individual and in some cases, there's no, you're not sharing the purpose or the mission of the organization at all. You're just giving them a list of 10 things that they need to do. And I think this principle of first who, then what, really changing even my own perspective on who, who are the people that I want to have around me to, to be my collaborators. Um, mm-hmm. It's not just the skills that they have, but it's you know who they are fundamentally as people. And are they aligned with the vision of what we're trying to accomplish together? Yeah, the the um, there's a. I'm really trying to think about practices that I see, know, feel that support this. And uh, I love this saying: to hire slow and to fire fast. Mm-hmm. And so I'm stealing a lot from his idea of getting the right people on the bus and off the bus. But I think as a default, we often get in quite um, a hurry to hire people and maybe skip over some important details, some important areas of alignment. And then all too often we hold on to people that are not a good fit for the organization, but for some reason we don't have the courage to just say, hey, listen, we've got to help you find something else. I think that's this, this hire slow, fire fast is a really good practice to focus on not only people first, but like really making sure you get the right people on the bus. My, my question for you, Chad, is if we play this out, what other people practices do you think help support this idea of first who, then what? That's a tough one for me because I'm really just now, I I feel like I'm just now kind of coming into my, my full leadership capacities in in my career. So I'm quite new at, um, all of these, you know, hiring and recruitment collaboration sorts of, of questions. But I think for me personally, it's understanding more about the person outside of the context of work to understand what some of their drivers and motivations are and see if and or how they connect to what we're trying to do or, or what this organization is trying, you know, to accomplish and what their purpose is. So you may find that if the whole purpose of the organization is really uh, delivering services to as many people in a certain population, well, what other ways is that person interested in or connected to uh, your end customers, you know, that, that, that you know that they could really get behind? I mean, mm. there's some specific interview questions or conversational questions that you can ask to begin to elicit um, some of this, but I think for me, it's weighting the non-technical and skill-based sorts of questions and screenings when it comes to to finding collaborators and and talent, and and focusing on their passions, what they feel like you know they're you know born to do, uh, what some of their other interests and and motivations are. Right, right, yeah. I also like the exercise if you want to be focused on the interview moment. Uh, I like to understand the stories they can tell me of moments when they were really collaborative, when they took a high degree of ownership, where they were learning, where they were committed to getting the job done and serving others. I'm like, oh, so you you like you really you really think you're a good communicator? 
tell me about a, a time where communication that you've done has really made a difference. Mm-hmm. And for me, I, I want to hear stories in detail so they can truly relate behavior they talk about to my expectations of how they'll behave in the organization. Yeah. And if they can't, if they can't talk about it in any specificity, I'm like, well, how conscious are you of this behavior if you're really struggling to tell me in some detail? It's actually uh, a technique I learned from Elon Musk when he's like, oh, you worked on a product? Tell me how you guys approached it. And he said he can tell almost instantly if someone really worked on the product because if they're unable to really tell you in any detail about some of the challenges they face and how they solve them, then you know that they were like, they're a passenger on it. They, they weren't really. Yeah. If they're going well, we uh, <laughs> you know that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another example uh, that came to mind, it, you and I love working in, it's almost a requirement for us to work in highly collaborative uh, environments. You can ask someone, you know, think of a time in which you, you feel like you were really accomplishing something great. Who helped you accomplish that? And so you can really understand if that person was able to to work with the team to get something accomplished and step outside of themselves and, and mm. figure out how they uh, worked with that team. And as you said, really focus on those stories to get those those interesting anecdotes and kind of hard data points on 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 how they were able to do it. Mm. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. So we know it's about level five leadership and being humble and serving others. We know it's like obsess about first who, then what. And if you need any inspiration about that, go to our previous show where I'm going to try and do my best Jim Collins. And he goes, first who, first who. Now, let me say it again. First who, then what? It's an impassioned plea to like, (laughs) hey, HP didn't even know what products they were going to make when they founded the company. It's okay. Just get a good cohort of people around you. Yeah. Yeah. And this is just like two of the principles. We've got four more principles coming your way. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Now, 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 just as, as a, a, a quick heads up uh, to all our listeners, remember, go to moonshots io if you want to pick up on the show notes for this episode or any other or you want to delve into any of the other 65 shows we've got elon musk uh we've got now talking about elon musk just for a second chad owen i'm feeling we might need to cut our third show on elon this guy you talk about getting a lot done in the last six months how are you feeling like elon is back uh do we need to to revisit I- elon yet we may just have to have a standing annual show on him. <laughs> I, I mean, the stock price speaks for itself at this point. I mean, it, it's, it's. Uh, I think it's definitely outperformed expectations of most analysts from last year. There were lots of woes. The fact that he's got his production, you know, problems taken care of, and they're they're churning out a thousand cars a day. I think it's it's pretty incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, indeed, indeed. So, so if you want to dig into any of that or find uh, Brené Brown, who else? Uh, let, let 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 me throw some names at you, Chad, and who's who's in our in our archive. I tell you, who else we could do another show on? Fred Smith, because I think you, I think uh, uh, FedEx might be in quite some trouble, don't you? I yeah, I it's it's one of those. Uh, Amazon can eat the world sorts of stories where mm-hmm. you know, most of Amazon's deliveries are, I saw some crazy statistic, but uh, they've essentially cut out the middle people of UPS and FedEx in a big way. So mm-hmm. um, I think I think they're a potential acquisition target, not for Amazon or another e-commerce retailer, but probably for a brick and mortar that wants to get into prime style shipping. You know, I don't know if that's a Target or a Walmart uh, or something like that, but there, yeah, there's, we could do, we could do 65 shows on the same individuals and come up with, uh, so many more. I mean, what you don't know listeners is we have our producing staff gives us about 20 clips uh, or more for each of these shows. And we can only bring you, you know, the top six to eight, sometimes 10, or we break all the rules and we'll bring you like 12 or 14 for someone, uh, really special, but yeah, there's so much stuff that hits the the cutting room floor. 
Yeah, just quickly, just for some inspiration on our archive on moonshots.io, uh, someone we should revisit is Ben Horowitz, the partner of Mark Andreessen, mm. uh, f- from you know one of the most esteemed uh, Andreessen Horowitz venture capital firm. Ben Horowitz has a has a new book out. Uh, what you do is who you are, which is a really interesting, uh, really interesting title. Just flicking through here, uh, Paige and Bryn have stepped down from Google. It would be interesting to re- revisit them. I mean, it's just fascinating. Uh, Tim Cook just seems to yeah, do. Jeff Bezos got to got to do another one on him too. Yeah, he's busy in India at the moment, but you know, Tim Cook continues to be just quite masterful, quite level five leadership. Hey quite level five. I think Jim Collins mm. would Im- would approve indeed. All right. We should get back to the show, but for any of those archive shows that we're mentioning, just drop over to moonshots.io. We have been in a world of leadership and getting the people right. But Chad, something happens. Something changes in a company when you've got the right people around the table because There's a sense of safety. uh, There's a sense of trust amongst each other. And that opens things up a little bit. And that means that the right conversations about the right topics can happen. So do you want to set the scene for this turn that we're going to make now? Now that we've got the right people, what's this next idea and what's the next clip we've got coming in this journey into good to great with Jim Collins? I'm trying to... Because built to last and good to great kind of bleed uh, together. I'm just triple checking that I've got the right companies here in in my head. But um, there's this principle of confronting the brutal facts, mm. and I think of this as a mental model where you have to be. So you talked about getting the right people in the room uh, to have the right conversations. Often, where people mess that up is they create a reality distortion field around themselves where the only reality that exists yeah. is in those four walls of that conference room. And they're not looking out into the world and getting the right inputs to understand really what's going on. And an example he uses from the book is the paper company, Kimberly Clark, that is in competition with others like Scott Paper, P&G, and, and many other companies. They decided to sell their paper mills and go all in oh my gosh. on consumer products because they saw the commoditization of the mill business and and the decline of it and and did a you know a 180 pivot to a product company and yeah. they sell billions of huggies every year now you know and again they became the good to great okay. kind of company and i think that's one of my favorite examples uh around this this mindset of um of, of confronting the brutal facts. Yeah, I, I have to say for, for the younger members of our audience, what they won't realize is Kimberly Clark used to be a paper company, <laughs> which seems ridiculous yeah, right well, now. No, they, they sold they, the mills uh, uh, in Kimberly, Wisconsin, like their namesake. Yeah. They sold those paper mills to go all in as a consumer, uh, a consumer product company. And, and at, at the time, everyone except the management team were like, this is the craziest thing ever. And it was the classic move of good to great. Now, Chad, Jim Collins actually kind of has like a whole uh, frame and and sort of name for this process. Do you want to just walk us through and set up this clip for us? Oh, sure. I think it the mindset's kind of um, summarized best in this clip that we have uh, for you where he's he's talking about the Stockdale paradox uh, from, from military history. I would like to give you a way of thinking that has been enormously helpful to me that came from the good to great research for dealing with great difficulty. And it was what we came to call the Stockdale Paradox. And the Stockdale Paradox was taught to us by, when we were doing the good to great research, we are trying to make sense of the CEOs. And, and in doing that, I just by chance happened to get to know Admiral Jim Stockdale, who was the highest ranking military officer in the Hanoi Hilton, shot down in 1967, was there till 1974. They could pull him out at any time and torture him, and they did. He was tortured over 20 times. And I had the privilege to get to know Admiral Stockdale and uh, we were going to the faculty club one day, 
and I had uh, read his book in Love and War, which was written in alternating chapters by himself and his wife about their years when he was in the camp. And I got depressed reading the book because it seemed so bleak. It seemed so difficult. It seemed, you know, it's like we can all endure anything if we know it's going to come to an end and we know when. But what if you don't know if it's ever going to come to an end? And you certainly don't know when. So I asked Admiral Stockdale how he dealt with that. And he said, you have to realize I never got depressed because I never, ever wavered in my faith that not only I would get out, but I would turn being in the camp into the defining event of my life that in retrospect I would not trade. Later when we were up the hill, I asked him, I said, Admiral Stockdale, who didn't make it out as strong as you? And he said, easy, it was the optimist. I said, the optimist? You sounded optimistic. He said, no, I was not optimistic. I never wavered in my faith that I would prevail in the end, but I was not optimistic. I said, what's the difference? Well, the optimists always thought we'd be out by Christmas. Of course, Christmas would come and it would go. And then we were going to be out by Easter and Thanksgiving, and then Christmas would come again, and they died of a broken heart. And that's when Admiral Stockdale grabbed me by the shoulders and said, this is what I learned. When you're facing, in, you're imprisoned by great calamity, by great difficulty, by great uncertainty, you have to, on the one hand, never confuse the need for unwavering faith that you will find a way to prevail in the end. With, on the other hand, the discipline to confront the most brutal facts we actually face. And we're not getting out of here by Christmas. Confronting the brutal facts, mm -hmm. those honest, frank conversations, how rarely do they actually happen? And how ironic that you can only really solve the problem if you confront the brutal facts. And yet so often we run away from the honest, frank truth, because it might make us look bad. It might make the company look bad. We might have a bad meeting in brackets. Mm -hmm. um, but I think like any good friendship, the capability to be direct and to do so without judgment so that you can present the brutal facts, because surely once you've presented the brutal facts, if people take it in the right way, you can build a constructive conversation and start heading towards a solution. But, oh, my gosh, it's just too rare. The conversations of getting into those brutal facts are just too damn rare. Yeah, I, I first came across this story about Admiral Jim Stockton in a different book, a book called The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. Here's my chance to plug uh Mm -hmm. my my love of stoicism oh uh, yes and i mean it's an extreme story I, I can't even imagine what it would have been like to been to have been in a prison prisoner of war camp for over seven years and 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 coming out of that experience as a survivor but the the two interesting things that i'm taking away as a learning from that story and how it applies to this principle is you never lose faith that in the end, you will overcome. Mm -hmm. Your time horizon may have to go from this quarter to maybe five or even 10 years. So in some ways, you have to be willing to stretch out that time horizon, but never give up. And you, at the same time, you have to confront the brutal reality that's right in front of you, not being fed properly, potentially mm -hmm. being tortured. In, you know, So that's not easy, but in the realm of business, it's there's going to be short-term pressures um, or actions, you know, like think of the eighties and in all of the hostile takeovers, you know, many companies were existentially threatened by these hostile takeovers and yet they still had to prove long-term viability to, to their shareholders. Mm. And if they weren't confronting the facts that they could potentially be acquired by, you know, one of these hostile takeovers, they would eat their lunch. And they would never be able to deliver on their long-term promise um, hmm. of the company over time. And so I, I think this is, as, as you're saying, an often overlooked reality when it comes to 
uh, leadership of, of a company. And importantly, what I would point out is I don't think you can confront the brutal facts if you don't have the right people and if you don't have humble characteristics because Mm. I think when a humble person puts to you, hey, I think we've got a big problem here and I think it's because of this, it's much easier to to say, oh, geez, well, maybe we do. If someone is perceived maybe as a little egotistical and someone like, we got a problem here. The feeling is instantly for those around that person is that there's blame being assigned. And I, I think if we can create emotional safety through being humble and having the right people around the table, then I think we're able to say, you know what, we're in a bad place. And I think it's only once you acknowledge that, that you can actually save it. It's, it, it's almost like if I was to draw a parallel with uh, our kind of consumer lives, I think it's when when people go through a trans- transformative health and and diet uh, revolution, where they lose a lot of weight and get themselves in shape, often they have to confront the brutal facts. And uh, I believe that um, AA one of the one of the Uh, principles for quitting alcohol is that you need to acknowledge or admit like that's like step one right admitting that you're actually that you're hooked Mm. so that what we do is we see this this theme everywhere that until you confront the brutal facts whether it's in your personal life at work until you're ready to acknowledge where you are where you are then what the Stockdale uh, concept points out is you you might be running the risk of being a little bit too optimistic and it's just a disappointment all the way if you mm-hmm. haven't started from the brutal facts. Yeah, I, I'd like to take us out of this little uh, valley of darkness here because it, it is a <laughs> very harrowing story. And if you've not read the book In Love and War, it's also a really good book. I, I read it after mm. I had, had come across the story. Um, but we have three more principles from good to great that we want to be sure that we deliver to you. And this next one, they're all my favorite, but this one is really interesting, I think, because of its novelty and it's quite easy to remember uh, because of its name. And it's called the the hedgehog concept. And that thinking is that there's two types of thinkers. There's, uh, There's foxes and there's hedgehogs. And we have a clip from Jim who's elaborating on why hedgehog thinkers are most uh, important when it comes to identifying uh, the right people, the right leaders, the level five leaders um, for companies that want to go from good to great. Now, when we took all our companies, we began to ask the question, well, is there any pattern to the one big thing that they all followed? Is is, Is there any sort of systematic framework that would explain it? And when we laid out all the information, what we found and saw in the mess of data was an underlying framework of three intersecting circles. And that what a really good hedgehog concept reflects is deep understanding of each of these three circles. Circle number one, what you are deeply passionate about. And nothing great can happen without beginning first with passion. And if you're not passionate, You can't possibly make it great. Circle number two is the lower left circle. And this is about understanding what you can be the best in the world at and equally what you cannot be the best in the world at. Not what you hope to be the best at, not what you aim to be the best at, but what you actually can be the best at. And then the third circle, bottom right, is what drives your economic engine. And we found in our research for corporations that they all got a simple penetrating underlying insight, a single ratio. If you could increase one ratio above all other ratios, profit per X, what one X would give you the highest rate of return over time? And it varies from company to company. So standing back then, a hedgehog concept is when you find the intersection of what you are passionate about, what you can be the best in the world at, and what best drives your economic engine, preferably consistent with a single ratio of profit per X. Hmm. 
Now, there's an interesting take on this, Chad Owen, because what we're really talking about is something that can be applied at a company level or at a personal level. Mm -hmm. So you you can actually play this two ways. I think for simplicity's sake, I think we should play this one more on the personal side of things. And to kind of kick things off... um, Well, I'll challenge you on the the company side. Okay, okay, go for it. Well, because I... Now that I'm hearing this clip again, mm. I actually think that this is probably the best, most succinct piece of advice in the entire book. Yes. That if you only take one thing away from this book and this this episode of, of Moonshots, answer those three questions mm. and you will be so far, and as a company, mm. Mm. you'll be so far away and ahead of everyone else what are you as the organization most passionate about? What are you fundamentally, I think he says like encoded, like almost at the DNA level. Yes. What are you in, what's your encoded expertise where you can be the best, not can be, where you are uh, able to be the best in the world? And then this idea of the economic engine, what is going to be the one true metric to rule them all? Mm. Uh, and he he uses, simplifies it to profit per X, but it could be anything um, profit per employee, profit per item shipped, uh, profit per website visit. You know, there's so many ways in which you can measure that. If you just answer those three questions as an organization, I think you're you're doing really well. Yeah, and I actually think to go deeper into this, that what are you encoded to be the best in the world at? If you can isolate one service, one product, one feature. Or if on a personal layer, at what is the one skill activity that you can be the best at the world at? I have found this very powerful, more powerful than what you're deeply passionate about, and particularly if you consider Cal Newport's craftsman mindset and what drives your economic engine. I think when a company or an individual raises the question, what can you be the best at the world at? Like when all said and done, what is the thing you are built to do? And when you do it as a company, it just it just happens. As a sports team, when you play the running game, when you play showtime basketball like the LA Lakers did, whatever it is, If you can isolate that, then the activity simply becomes, let's go find an economic engine. Let's find our passion in that. But also, if you know Mm. that you can be the best of the world at one thing, then you just go and find things that help you achieve that status of being the best in the world. And actually, I think a lot of companies lack that clarity. So many companies try to be all things to everyone, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who's your customer? Oh, well, everyone. Mm -hmm. I can sell this to anybody. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Oh, we've got a service for this and a product for that. And we've got another service and another service. Like one of the most amazing things is every new CEO that's brought in to clean out a company, the first thing they do for the larger publicly listed companies, what are they often doing? Oh, hang on a sec. We're in way too many businesses. We're selling off this, this, and this, and this. Mm -hmm. Let's focus on just a few, if not just one thing. What I think the the big yeah, what is your concept? You got to answer that question. And what's so great about it is that you can apply it. And here's a similarity to draw with Cynic again. Cynic start with why or his uh, golden circle framework can be applied to the individual or the product or the company as can the hedgehog concept too. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I, I also, I agree with you in that it's the, what's, I call it unique ability. What's, what are you mm. designed for uh, as an organization or as a person? And what do you do better than nearly everyone else? I think it's most important to identify that first. Why I think it's also important to include passion is that's where, that's how you Mm. answer that question of motivation Mm. that we were talking about at the beginning of the show. In, in order to have those people that are innately motivated, there has, you have to identify and see a level of passion for that Mm. single uh, thing uh, in order to keep the people motivated. Otherwise you'll be, you know, Mm. rolling the boulder 
up the hill. And then again, you and I love the data. So it's just like, well, how do we know if we're on the right track? That's where that key metric or the economic engine uh, comes into play where that's how you're you're measuring your success. So uh, coming back to FedEx, if you go back and listen uh, to our episode on Fred Wilson, you'll know that I don't think he stated it as the hedgehog concept, but he was measuring the success of his company mm-hmm. in, in profit per employee. And that told you exactly all you needed to know about his focus. It was really about creating a magical enabling employee experience that he knew would trickle mm. down to the customer experience. And we've seen the success of that. Yes. Uh, so the hedgehog concept, just Google it. Uh, we'll throw in a few links uh, in the show notes so that you can kind of dig into the hedgehog concept. because so It's really, it's it's a very powerful little tool to use. And uh, I think you'll find it useful on many layers. But what's interesting uh, is this next clip is really a bit of a nod to the book that we're going to cover in our next show, Great by Choice. We're going to open up now our thinking, and it, and it sort of follows the journey. So you've got servant, humble leadership, where you get the right people on the bus, you have the right conversations, and those conversations are around those questions in the hedgehog, hedgehog concept. But the key thing is, you then have to apply this. You have to get to work. You have to roll up the sleeves. And what we've got coming now is Jim Collins talking about the next key fundamental step in this journey from good to great. And it's all about a culture of discipline. So let's have a look at Jim Collins talking about pockets of greatness. Will you build your unit, your minibus, into a pocket of greatness? One thing I gained greater appreciation for at West Point is that great leadership at the top doesn't amount to very much without exceptional leadership at the unit level. This is the cellular structure. This is where great things get done. And when I look at how the good to great CEOs became CEO, they did it by not focusing on their career. They focused on their unit of responsibility. And at every stage of their career, whatever they were running, whether it be in a little accounting department or whether it be a manufacturing facility, controllership, they built their unit into a pocket of greatness. And that is why they were tapped. Focus on your unit, not on your career. Every responsibility you get, make it a pocket of greatness. And if you do that, you are more likely to die of indigestion for too much of too much responsibility than starvation for too little. And focusing on your unit means, above all, being a first who leader rather than a first what leader. And that the number one executive skill for building a pocket of greatness of any size is figuring out who should be in the key seats on the bus. To be rigorous about your people decisions And we've spoken about this before, but it also means being not ruthless. Be rigorous, not ruthless. And that means taking care of your people. For in the end, life is people. I love how this ties back to one of the core principles of Built to Last, which is this concept of promoting from within instead of without. And I think it was... Uh, all but one of the companies in Built to Last had uh, leaders promoted from within uh, instead of being recruited from outside. And this idea of starting with the people that are right around you in the organization, you don't have to be the, be the CEO to create a culture of discipline. He says, just start with the people that are right around you and create the pocket of greatness. And that is going to spread this culture of discipline. Mm. Mm. And isn't it nice that he gives us an, a, a helpful, super practical, very common sense reminder, don't focus on yourself, focus on that small cohort around you and get the right people in the right seats, get people playing in the right position. That That's where that, that pocket of greatness is and be disciplined in focusing on the culture amongst those people. One of the things that he brings up in the book that sets the good to great companies apart from 
the control companies is often both companies would kind of pop and break out in terms of market performance at the same time, but there would be a sharp decline That's right. in, That's right. in, the, in the control company. And when they looked at why that happened, they saw that in the control company, there was almost a tyrannical leader that was forcing the discipline in the company and being a, a bit of a taskmaster, and that that kind of uh, culture was unsustainable in the long run. And then if you just go back and listen to the clip we just listened to, in, instead, those kinds of leaders that were concerned not about themselves, but their, their unit around them, mm. those were the leaders that were able to take uh, the companies from, from good to great. And so this idea of you know, forcing a culture of discipline, it's not really the way to go. It has to be uh, more emergent and kind of grassroots. Yeah, and and I think the um, the crazy reminder that we get from both Sinek and Jim Collins is that we vastly underestimate culture and people, and we're often we often have a sort of preoccupation with the idea or, or, or the shiny logo mm-hmm. and how really the behaviors and the culture within an organization have such an influence on the outcome. And to your point about leadership, what was also really crazy is that in good to great companies, what he found was that when the primary CEO and leader left, the company continued to be great. Yet mm-hmm. in the control companies, as soon as the dictator left, it would crash. Yeah. And that's because they created that cult of personality around them. Uh, they hoarded information uh, and resources. Yeah. It, it created an unsustainable path forward mm. for the company. And the mm. worst part is those executives often took multi tens of millions of dollars in golden parachutes on the way out with them. Right. Totally. Totally. Because it was about them and it wasn't about the company. Exactly. Because it was about their status, um, not the legacy of the company. Yeah. I don't want to name names here, but I'm looking at you, Adam Newman, from (laughs) WeWork. Oh, my gosh. Kaboom. Well, moving uh, to the last and final clip and the last big idea that is inside of Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, uh, we have one more idea, but I would remind you that if any of these topics have piqued your interest, jump across to moonshots.io. If you are enjoying the show, jump into your podcast app just while you're listening. Give us a review or a rating. Share this with others. We would deeply appreciate that. And uh, let's turn our listening ears now to uh, the last and, and final concept. Now, the flywheel concept is well it's it's something that Jim Collins has has brought to life and we have talked a lot about flywheel effects in relationship to Amazon so i think we should now lend our ears to Jim Collins one final time to hear about the turning of the flywheel and i'm excited to share my latest publication it's called turning the flywheel It's a monograph to accompany good to great. And the monograph begins with the story of Amazon, Amazon Amazon.com, grabbing the flywheel concept. Coming out of the dot-com bust in 2001 after being taught the idea, but then taking it to another level and saying what we need to do is to capture the drivers in our flywheel, crystallize the components of our flywheel and then turn that flywheel to build relentless momentum, unstoppable momentum. The Amazon case is an archetype of a spectacularly powerful flywheel and it's the starting point of this conversation. But what it really leads to is the idea that to get full power out of the flywheel principle It's very helpful to rigorously ask the question, how does our flywheel turn? What are the components in our flywheel? What's the sequence in the flywheel? 
How can we do for ourselves what Amazon did for itself? Now, your flywheel will almost certainly be different than Amazon's. But as we point out in the monograph, its logic should be equally sound, equally compelling. The monograph moves on to share flywheels from a range of types of organizations. We're looking at small companies, healthcare organizations, nonprofits, arts organizations, and there's even a delightful discovery of a rural elementary school articulating and turning a flywheel so that children learn. So I know I said the hedgehog concept was the most important uh, takeaway <laughs> from the book. But are you cheating, Chad? No, I'm I not, think you might be cheating. I'm not cheating. <laughs> Finding your hedgehog concept is is your homework for for tomorrow. Understanding, uncovering, <laughs> creating, and investing in your flywheel, that's the key to your long-term success. And oh, that's just yeah, that's momentum, right? Yeah. And 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 I see the flywheel effect much more as a framework and a system as opposed to kind of the simplicity of the three circles of the hedgehog concept. But it, You'll, you heard him talk about this new monograph book. S -s one of the final chapters in Good to Great is called Turning the Flywheel. He has since turned that into a little mini-sized business book that's also worth uh, checking out if you're interested in learning more about this concept of the flywheel and, and getting some really interesting examples, Amazon included. Uh, Mike and I have talked about it on the shows in which we talk about Jeff Bezos, episode number three, as well as the, the Elon versus... Uh, Jeff episode, but I don't see many companies understanding what their flywheel is, let alone knowing what <laughs> a flywheel is, Mike. So I'm curious for you, um, how can we begin to understand and uncover what our uh, flywheels are? So I think a, a simple practice would be to ask yourself, what seem to be the causes and the things that correlate with our success as a company. If we have X, Y, and Z, we tend to do really well. And I would look at both direct and indirect things. I would look at things that you control and things you don't control. But most importantly, obviously, focus on the things you control. Jeff Bezos says if he has more videos on Amazon Prime, he will sell more shoes on the Amazon store. He knows that there is a flywheel effect that if people come for great content, they leave with a new pair of shoes. So that's why he has Amazon Prime. Uh, that's why he has a free video component to that offering. That's his flywheel effect. And so I, I challenge all of our listeners to ask themselves, when certain conditions uh, are around, you succeed. And perhaps when you want to look at cause and causation and correlation, perhaps you also want to say, well, hey, I did the same thing but had two very different outcomes. What were the things that were different? Much like in how Jim Collins approached this whole book, what are the things that were different? Because you might isolate not only the things that create your flywheel effect, but those that hamper the flywheel effect. Now, upon hearing that, Chad, does that give you any inspiration to think about what we do or about what other brands do on, on how they might find their flywheel? Yeah, be warned. I might be sending you a, an, a calendar invite for us to, to have a collaboration <laughs> session to figure out what our flywheel is. <laughs> My my uh, light bulb moment was we often think about business processes in a linear fashion. You know, we think about the customer journey or you know service delivery uh, processes. The important thing about the flywheel is it's circular and self reinforcing. So as you're saying, it's those it's those most important interactions within or outside of the company with your customers that is providing value into the next stage, which is providing value into the next stage, which then comes back to the beginning to make the next turn of that flywheel easier. So as you're saying with Amazon, Bezos knows that it they can go super wide in their product offerings because he knows that for every customer touch point, he can get you know, X additional uh, in revenue. 
So yes, I may only be interested in buying sneakers on Amazon, but hey, I see this cool show on on Prime. Now I'm hooked into, I'm in the system and Amazon Prime at the middle of it, you know, being able to give me those shoes uh, in just one day, that's how they can continue to to turn that flywheel. And as we as we've seen, Amazon is pretty much unstoppable at this point in whatever business they're going into. And it's because they have that perpetual momentum from from the flywheel that started turning all the way back in what was it, ninety five when Amazon was started? I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's been uh, it's been quite some time now. Yes. Um, and what's really fascinating, if you dig into the book, it's not just Amazon, but uh, Jim was even able to see this this pattern playing out in elementary schools, which is just so that's I mean, that's really exciting that Jim Collins could even find uh, the flywheel effect taking place in an elementary school. And it's mm-hmm. speaking a little bit to the timeless, timely, the timeless, uh, nature of of his work and how it can endure to remind us and to continually you know tap us on the shoulder and say hey level five leadership hey first who then what and it is for me some very memorable very clear recommendations that Jim has for us and I th- I think you could almost spend a career just trying to get some of these right I mean. There's a lot of work in this. Let's let's not sugarcoat it. But you can start with the hedgehog concept and then take on the uh, the big challenge that is uh, uncovering and investing in your flywheel. Mm. That's true. That's but we're very not done yet, true. right, Mike? We've still got yet another book Ooh, from Jim that we're going to be profiling yes. here on the show. Yeah, great by choice. Great by choice, and and what a n- a nice uh, companion to. Some of the, the the concepts not only in good to great, um, but what we learned in the previous show when we were digging into to built to last, and I think you, what you can expect in uh, great by choice is once again this theme that greatness is not down to luck or to chance. There's a lot of hard work that goes into it, and the great news is in our next show we're going to dig into this and we're going to try and uncover it. We're going to try and decode it and share it with you, our listeners. And I think it, this is the moment where we need to remind our listeners how much we enjoy their feedback. What's your favorite way, Chad? Come on. It's time to remind them. How do you like to hear from our millions of listeners? I love getting emails in my inbox at hello at moonshots.io. Always puts a smile on my face and getting an email from someone in a far flung locale. I want to take this time to give a shout out to Maria in Tunisia and all of our other listeners, not just here in the States or in Romania or Mm -hmm. in England Mm -hmm. or Australia, but everywhere else. Uh, We've been, you know, rocketing up the charts. I mean, granted, we're, you know, number 100 in business podcasts, but hey, I'll take it Um, (laughs) in countries like um, Saudi Arabia, Iceland, Nigeria. So it's, it's fun to know that we have listeners in all of those, those different locales. Yeah, yeah. And w- we keep getting more and more uh, outreach from our listeners. We got a note uh, just just before the show, actually, 29 minutes before we started recording uh, from Denise. Hello, Denise. Thanks for sending us a note. We really appreciate uh, the thoughts that you sent through to us. And uh, we encourage all of you to go to moonshots.io to jump in and be part of the conversation about how we get to good to great or how we be great by choice. Whew. Chad, what a journey. We have come to the end of another show. What did you enjoy the most in revisiting one of our classics? It sounds like you may have traded a, your allegiance from the hedgehog concept to the flywheel. I, I need to know where you stand on what is your favorite uh, good to great concept. Uh, I love the hedgehog concept. If for no other reason that when I was a kid, I had a buzz cut where I spiked my hair and had a nickname of the hedgehog. So I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the hedgehog concept. But I, to me, that's a really fun um, exercise that you can do on your own. Uh, maybe go into monk mode for a few hours somewhere, turn off all your notifications, bring a notebook with you and write out your answers to uh, what am I uniquely 
uh, capable of that I can be the best at? What am I passionate about? And what's the economic engine behind it? It's, it's a pretty, uh, I think it's a pretty, uh, you could get a lot out of going through that exercise. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there we have it. We're, we're now past the halfway mark in our Jim Collins series. We will be jumping into Great by Choice in the next episode. We're going to have to put our thinking caps on, Chad, as to where we go next. Life after Jim Collins. It's, it's pretty hard to think about, but it's true. It's been just so good to go back to this classic. So a thank you to you. A thank you to all of our listeners. And we hope that you join us for the next show where we jump into the world of Jim Collins and Great by Choice. But for now, we've finished our journey into good to great. That's the end of another Moonshots podcast. That's a wrap. <laughs>